Our next speaker is Charlie Tang. The title of the paper is Learning Generating Models and, uh, with Visual Attention. And the authors are uh, Charlie Tang, uh, Nitish uh, Srivastava, and Raslan Selectunino. And um, let's welcome Charlie. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, today I will talk about, I will present a uh, probabilistic framework that uses visual attention to learn general models of interesting objects within a large image. Uh, as you see on the, on the right, we have a demonstration of, the, of our framework, which uses uh, visual attention uh, to focus onto the object of interest, which is a face in this image. So in this case, um, the visual attention latent variables is, is initialized at the yellow box and quickly focuses onto, onto the right to the, uh, the face. There are many previous work in this area, starting with uh, canonical object-based representation by Jeff Hinton in uh, 1981, uh, where there's mapping units, then there's neurobiological computational neuroscience models, followed by uh, third-order Boltzmann machine models, um, tracking, image detection, and uh, recurrent visual models recently, and there's two papers in NIPS, which have similar flavors. <clears throat> um, so, the reason that we, we still are interested in generative models is that we think that by learning good generative, mo generative models of data, hopefully we can lead, that will lead to learning meaningful latent variables. Um, and certain advantages do exist with generative models, including uh, when dealing with noise or missing data, such, such uh, which can occur when, you, when you're trying to recognize an object and there's partial occlusion. So in one-shot learning, for example, um, when you're trying to learn a new concept with a few exemplars, that's an advantage to generative learning. So moving forward, um, we want to be able to learn interesting objects from unconstrained, large, realistic, natural images. In this case, we care about the face, but we don't care about the background. So we want to be able to generatively model the, the, the foreground the face, uh, but we don't want to spend actual extra computational resources in modeling the, uh, the background. Uh, we used the deep generative model we use in this work is the Gaussian deep belief network. Um, this network is a hybrid undirected directed graphical model. And uh, for training, we use both the contrasted divergence algorithm and the fast persistent contrasted divergence algorithm to, uh, to train this model. And as you see on the right, this is a Gaussian DBN trained on faces. And the samples that it generated are both realistic and diverse. So it is a pretty good generative model of faces. Um, for our full, full framework, we want to be able to use, uh, we're actually inspired by the shifter circuit, which is a computational neuroscience paper uh, model from the 90s. Um, in it, it has the visual stimulus of the retina is being mapped to a object-centric canonical view reference frame. From there, it can be modeled by associative memory. Um, the model also have control, control neurons to dynamically uh, modify the synapses to shift <coughs> stimulus from other parts of the visual field. If, uh, for example, if the A changed from right to left. Um, by doing that, we maintain a uh, invariant representation, canonical representation of the, uh, the input. And also for covert attention, this is also a theory of how the brain is able to route uh, stimulus from V1 up to higher cortical areas. So in our proposed model, we take the, uh, the associated memory and we replace it with a Gaussian deep leaf network. Um, we also then uh, take the uh, visible units of the deep leaf network and that could be corresponds to the object-centered reference frame. We use 2D similarity transformation from computer vision uh, to perform routing, it's a simple, uh, easy way, and not very, uh, but not very biological. Um, however, it's also another important thing uh, to notice here is that we're interested in only modeling X of U, which is small image patch within the large input image. So how do we obtain X of U? X of U is our data, and uh, we use uh, bilinear sampling and 2D similarity transformation to obtain it. So let's say that P is a point, a Cartesian 2D point of the image. Um, we have a transformation parameter, u, which uh, 
it's four dimensional models shift rotation and scale. Um, from that, we have a warping function W that takes the transformation parameter U and a point P and maps it to a new point P prime. As you see the, uh, the mapping over here. Um, and the transformation is done by, via simple linear transformation, um, as you see down there. So once we have a set of new point P, new set, a set of new points P prime, we use 2D, um, sorry, we use bilinear sampling to extract X of U from the large input image. And this is the, this is the smaller data that we're going to, to focus our, our generative attention modeling on. Um, so that's, our gen that's, that's the way we do it. Um, the full generative equation that we have is stated as follows. We have PV, which is the probability, uh, the deep belief net assigns to the canonical uh, viewed face for, in this example. We also have a flat or uniform prior over U, which is transformation uh, latent variables. Given V and U, they combine to generate X of U, and it's simply a, ga a diagonal Gaussian. So this is the, this is the generative uh, process. Now for inference, the, um, from bottom going up, we're interested in, in the probability of U and V given the input image I. And um, because this is a directed graphical model, and uh, unlike deep Boltzmann machines or, deep, or the original deep leaf nets, um, there are no simplifying or factorial assumptions here. So inference is uh, it's a bit harder. And for inference, we have to resort to alternate sampling between U and V. And what that means is that condition on V, we can sample U, and vice versa, condition on U, we can sample V. For probability of U given V given U and H1, where H1 is the hidden state of the deep belief network, um, the math works out to be simply a Gaussian. And it's interesting to note that this, the mean of the Gaussian is simply a average of mu and xu, where mu is the top-down um, expectation of the deep belief net, and x of u is the bottom-up signal. On the other hand, the probability of u given x and v, so basically what's the probability distribution over the transformation parameters given, um, given state v, we can use the base rule, and the log posterior turns out to be this, uh, this proportional, this quadratic, quadratic term, um, where each term is a, simply a square between, x, between the signal x and what is currently in the latent variable canonical v. The interesting to note is that unlike other typical generative models, uh, our data here x is not static, it's actually dynamic, it's actually a function of our latent variable u. And so that, what that means is that given rotation or shifts, um, of our model U, we will have a different small patch X. And so this makes the, uh, this complicates the posterior energy landscape of U, um, which makes inference harder. Uh, for inference in this, uh, because the fact that U is, continu is a continuous variable, um, we're going to use HMC or, or uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, to, 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 uh, to sample from this, the posterior over U. Uh, HMC requires a derivative of dx by du, which uh, we can efficiently calculate based on the, the image uh, intensity gradients. However, there are some difficulties with this inference process. Um, the HMC is similar to phase alignment with gradient descent, and in division literature, there's the lucas Canati framework, the, the well-known, uh, that, that which performs maximization over the log posterior, which is very similar to what we're doing here. And a common problem that they have is that inference might uh, possibly get stuck at a local minimum. And so this is something that we also have experienced with HMC. Um, so in this example, as you see, now the, the alignment or HMC would sort of get stuck as the wrong eyes gets matched. And the reason it does this is because there is a huge energy barrier uh, between the modes of the posterior and U. So it's hard for the, for the, uh, the sort of the, the canonical view to shift over due to the edge of the the chin, and it's also, also the eye alignment. Um, and so this is a problem. To solve this problem, we resort to a convolutional neural net to try to give us good proposals or good initializations of U. So what we do here is we take the V canonical image, and then we take a crop, which is the, the yellow uh, context window, and then we send it as input to two streams of a convolutional neural net and they get combined in, up there in the middle. And the output of the neural net is simply a four-dimensional variable which uh, tells us how to correct our uh, transformation parameters u. Given this prediction, we can then feed that back into our model 
and with updated U, this can have attentional gating of the input, and we can make an update on the next the window at the next next time step. <laughs> Given the update, we can then send the uh, the green the green square, which is X of U, up to the, the latent canonical view V, and then we can run a few Gip DBN steps uh, to to figure out a uh, a sample for V, and then this whole process continues. And notice the small correction that happens. And uh, this, this whole thing repeats, and uh, for example, after about five iterations, we, uh, we're able to uh, focus on a, a good initialization or around the face. And so we, another way of thinking about using ComNet is that this ComNet provides a feed-forward approximate inference network um, in order to uh, help HMC not get stuck or, or help us localize, start off the HMC at a, a good posterior mode. So after several iterations, we can run HMC, and the reason we want to do that is that because it's a proper MCMC um, -MC algorithm, which satisfies detail balance, so we're good in that, uh, that area. Um, and it also makes fine tune adjustments. Um, so that's inference, and now we move on to learning. So the ultimate goal of our frameworks is that we want to be able to learn from large images, collections of Facebook images or whatnot, um, which contains objects of interest, but not necessarily the labels. Um, so, t in order to, to uh, solve this problem, we resort to Monte Carlo EM algorithm, where in the E step, we use both the ComNet approximate inference as well as the HMC sampling over U to try to uh, localize the object of interest. So, essentially, it's acting as a detector, but, in a, as, but as part of a probabilistic framework. And provided that we, the, during the E step, we can achieve uh, a good, accurate uh, localization of the object interest, then in doing the M step, we can update the parameters of our generative model, in this case, the Gaussian deep leaf net, and learn the object. <laughs> and so, that, so that's, the, that's the learning in our, uh, in our framework. Okay, so let's move on to the experiments. Um, here we have some quant qualitative uh, results on our inference, approximate and proper inference algorithm for uh, uh, for a model, so as you see, there's three test images, and uh, the yellow square is the initial gaze or attention, uh, which are initialized randomly, and after a few approximate inference steps, it focuses very quickly onto the uh, correct uh, object of interest, which is faces. The, if, as far as the canonical V is concerned, it's always initialized with the average face overall of the data set, because we don't know, essentially we don't know what the faces in the, in the test image is. Um, the magenta colored boxes are the, are demonstrates what HMC does, making fine adjustments. Um, so essentially the common makes large jumps and HMC makes local jumps. And also notice that the V changes as, as, uh, as we perform inference because v, uh, canonical V is also a latent variable and it's updated as we sample the deep leaf net. Um, even though our model is not a designed to compete as an object detector, um, we've really tested simply against the Viola Jones on a, on a, a small Caltech faces, and it does reasonably well. Um, so the, and the, here are just some quantitative numbers on localization. Uh, there's some good properties of our approximate inference algorithm, and one property is that it's rather insensitive to initial conditions. So here, this plot shows that the accuracy degrades <laughs> Uh, relatively well, um, gracefully, with respect to the initial offset. So the further away you initialize the initial attention, uh, it still is able to do a reasonably good job. Also another property is that uh, it requires only a few steps for convergence onto, uh, accurately onto the object, and, this is, and these are performed on the Caltech faces. Um, for the learning experiments, we first train the Gaussian deep leaf net on Caltech faces. And here are some samples from the train, train the deep, deep leaf net. So it's, it's, it's able to do a reasonable job. After that, then we train a calm net discriminatively on the Caltech faces and 10% of the CMU faces with labels. So this is for the approximate inference calm net. And so we need some of some discriminative training. So after these two pre-training uh, steps, then we can use our framework as part of the EM learning algorithms on the remaining 90% of CMU faces, 
uh, whereas this is done without face location labels. After the M step uh, um, of the learning algorithm, then we can resample from the newly updated Gaussian deep leaf network. Uh, and as you see here on the right, uh, right side, um, the green boxes highlight samples which are roughly visually sort of similar to the, uh, the faces from the CMU distribution. And so the takeaway is that the, after learning from the unlabeled, 90% um, of the CMU faces unlabeled, the Gaussian deep leaf net is able, the general model is able to adapt to both distributions. Uh, quantitatively, we have, um, we, we go from 85 nats to 387 nats, where the higher is the better. Um, when we estimate the variational lower bound assigned by the Gaussian deep leaf net to the ground truth, the crop faces. Um, here we note that um, if we use the full labels, like the location labels for the CMU faces, we can achieve around 500. Um, so those are the learning examples. Um, now, one interesting thing is that you might ask is, what's, what is the difference between this framework and a standard face detector? So if we look at this Euclidean distance space plot of image patches, um, you can imagine a face manifold in black, and this will be the manifold of all possible faces, whereas the, in the middle there's the average face. If you take a look at the testing image in the bottom, we can draw a red manifold representing all possible patches intensity of all, pa all patches in the testing image. And where the two manifolds intersect are points corresponding to faces within the testing image, like this. Um, and you also notice on the, on the lower, lower left, there is a non-face patch which might lie somewhere off uh, on, the, in the, on the red manifold. So <coughs> the reason, um, the difference here is that with standard face detectors, they only care about P of U given I, so, and, and they ignore V. And what that means is that if you have multiple people within the same image, then face detector would be, it would be ambiguous for face detectors to, um, to know where to attend to next. Whereas with our framework, uh, we model P of U given V, because U and V are both latent variables in, 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 in our model, and we can condition on one on, condition on one. And when you do that, then where to gaze becomes a function of the canonical image, <coughs> which is useful. Um, here we have an example showing uh, exactly why this is useful. Uh, this, this, this diagram here um, shows that where to attend is a function of what model has in mind. So if you look at the left and right panel, everything's the same. The model is the same. The test image is the same. And the initial gaze is the same. It's the yellow box. Um, the only thing that's different is the canonical image V, whereas the, uh, the lady is on the, uh, the picture of the lady is on the left, and uh, the picture of the, the image of the gentleman is on the right. So if we play the inference uh, procedure, um, you see that um, the infer as inference runs, the gaze shifted to the left for the, for the panel on the left, and for the vice versa for the right panel. If we let inference run, it will shift all the way to the right. Um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is good because um, the log posterior of the U condition on V should be higher if we shift it left for the left panel, and vice versa should be higher if we shift it right in the right panel because, of, because the V changed. Um, so, and so again, so this is, um, so, so, so this is, I guess this would be the main difference, um, and is that we have a sort of a holistic probabilistic framework, we can condition on variable on one and on the other um, uh, as part of the generative model. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, so with this work, we've uh, proposed a probabilistic framework for learning generative models using visual attention um, and some, uh, and 2D similarity transformations from vision. We've demonstrated that approximate uh, inference using a calm net and also running HMC, we're able to reasonably, uh, ex reasonably well explore the posterior space of the gaze variable U. Um, and most importantly, and this is important for future work, is that um, our model allows for learning general models in larger images without the location, location the labels, but albeit after a bit of uh, supervised pre-training. So thank you. <coughs> Uh, 
I'm a little bit worried about your training procedure. So imagine that uh, your model starts seeing, uh, say, sky patches or like easy, easy patches. It will be very happy to give high probability to these. And then the inference on the attention will you know, provide more of these easy patches. And um, uh, it, it won't be modeling faces anymore. So I'm, I'm guessing it's working here because you've initialized both of the, the ContNet and the DBN with faces. But um, this I could easily imagine that the training slides into some very bad territories here. You're not really doing EM, you're doing something strange. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a good comment. Um, the, um, for this to work reasonably well, you need to pre-train on the faces. So because uh, in that, you know, the, the deep leaf net has no prior over uh, object class or, or the other. So the runway um, condition is plausible. So um, I guess uh, the answer is that that still requires further uh, for their future work, but it definitely is possible to have a runaway like you suggested. How robust is your model to changes in expression? Suppose you give a picture of a happy face of that person and uh, you happen to get a unhappy expression. Yeah, so uh, good question. So um, it's all about part of the, um, the generative model of the, uh, the DBN. And that's the, so for example, the Toronto face data set has different expressions and it's able to capture gener uh, these sort of expressions generatively as well. Um, so what, after that's done, then part of the, part of the training involving um, training on inf essentially infinite, infinite data with the, uh, with the uh, ComNet because you can synthetically generate these 2D similar transformations. So it would work reasonably well for different expressions. Uh, it would be problematic for 3D in-depth rotation because we cannot synthetically generate a lot of data. So that's one area where, um, yeah, area for f future work. I enjoyed the talk. I thought there was um, one thing I, I was a bit scary though is this idea that you can just pay attention to certain parts of the image. And yeah. I think there's a way to fix that, which is that in work on sprites, you used to have this thing with a kind of foreground and background mask. And if you have a very simple background model, like say independence at each pixel, you have mm -hmm. to model a whole image. And I think that's, I think there's otherwise, and that may help the danger that Yoshua was talking about exactly. You know, so I think okay. we can sort of improve it and maybe even get, avoid some of the pre-training. I see. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.